I'd like to begin by welcoming the Cabinet Secretary for Social Justice, Housing and Local Government. Oh, I missed a bit. Where? Apologies, we're going to start again. Okay. Um, I'd like to uh, welcome you to the third meeting of the Local Government Housing and Planning Committee in Session 6. Our first item this morning is consideration of whether to take item three in private. Item three will be an opportunity for members to reflect on the evidence they've heard earlier in the meeting. Do members agree to take item three in private? Agenda item is an opportunity for the committee to take evidence to inform its understanding of what its key priorities should be for this session. It's also an opportunity for the committee to inform its pre-budget scrutiny. The committee will be taking evidence from the Cabinet Secretary for Social Justice, Housing and Local Government, and then evidence from COSLA. Both of these sessions will take place virtually. I'd like to begin by warmly welcoming the Cabinet Secretary for Social Justice, Housing and Local Government to the committee for the session for the first time in this session. And I'd also like to welcome her officials. Katrina McKean, Deputy Director for Better Homes. Carolyn Dix, Head of Affordable Housing Supply Program. And Stephen Garvin, Deputy, De De Deputy Director for Building Standards. Um, so I would like to invite the Cabinet Secretary to make some opening remarks. Thank you. Welcome. Hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, convener. Um, I really welcome the opportunity to engage with the, the committee this morning. I'm sure it will be the, the first of a, a number of engagements around these very important issues that we'll touch on today. And I'm sure, as you're aware, my new portfolio is very wide ranging and uh, whilst challenging, it really does offer a, a great opportunity to address the issues at the, the heart of achieving a fairer Scotland. And of course, as part of that, housing must be a, a key part of the recovery and housing to 2040, which is, of course, Scotland's first ever long term housing strategy, sets out our vision for Scotland's homes and communities and our approach to improving Scotland's housing over the next two decades. The strategy shows how integral housing is to our objectives to tackle poverty and inequality, create and support jobs, meet energy efficiency and decarbonisation aims, and fuel poverty and child poverty targets, and of course create connected, cohesive communities. We have a, an increased ambition to deliver 110,000 affordable homes by 2032, with at least 70 per cent for social rent and 10 per cent in our remote rural and island communities. Uh, we have also been concentrating on the first 100-day commitments. And one such commitment was to begin cladding assessments, and we have agreed to fund assessment and remediation where the need is identified, and to do that to use all of the available consequential funding. A further important 100 days com commitment has been to develop a new rented sector strategy. The forthcoming strategy will deliver a, a new deal for tenants, giving them more secure, stable, affordable tenancies with improved standards of accommodation, new controls on rent and more flexibility to personalise homes. And we'll also introduce a new housing regulator for the, the private rented sector. We'll consult on a, a draft strategy in early 2022, helping to inform a housing bill in the second year of the Parliament to bring in some of the legislative elements required to meet these challenges. Uh, we're working at pace to develop a £10 million tenant grant fund uh, to provide support for renters who have been financially impacted by the pandemic, including how the fund will interact with the existing tenant Hardship Loan Fund, which has provided over £500,000 of loans so far. Also uh, to be established is the short-term licensing legislation. We consider this to be vital in balancing the needs and concerns of residents and communities with wider economic and tourism interests. 
when we intend to lay the legislation in Parliament in November. Our ongoing work to meet our climate change targets is also critical. By 2030, at least 1 million Scottish homes and around 50,000 non-domestic buildings will need to change their heating systems for a, a zero carbon one, uh, not uh, an easy challenge. Our draft uh, heat and building strategy sets out actions to transform Scotland's building stock over the next 24 years, playing a, a key role to uh, meet emissions targets and removing poor energy efficiency as a driver of fuel poverty. We are stepping up our investment over the next five years and have allocated £1.8 billion to support the accelerated deployment of heat and energy efficiency measures in homes and buildings across Scotland. Working alongside the Cabinet Secretary for Net Zero Energy and Transport, we will do all we can to support a just transition as we decarbonise housing across Scotland. And I want to conclude my opening remarks with uh, a brief focus on child poverty, which um, we are very aware that meeting the statutory targets set by the Child Poverty Act will be challenging, particularly uh, without full powers to, drive, to tackle the drivers of poverty. But we see ending child poverty as a national mission and are concentrating our efforts in this area to deliver real change last year. We invested around two and a half billion pounds to support low-income households, including nearly a billion to directly support children. And we will outline further me uh, measures to tackle child poverty in our next delivery plan to be published in March of next year. And this will set out the further action at pace and scale required to deliver further progress. Convener, I hope this very brief overview of some of our key priority areas is helpful. And of course, I'm happy to answer any questions that the committee may have. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary, and, and I really appreciate your opening remarks. It points us in a good direction for asking our questions. And I just want to comment on the fact that I, I think we do have a great opportunity. Um, as you said, you know, you're, you're um, overseeing a wide-ranging a wide area, but I think they're joined up, and, and something that we've been talking about in the committee is that the fact that we're, our committee is local government, housing and planning, and there's something very important about holding that all together and seeing how those aspects of how we design Scotland um, uh, work. Um, I think that's, you know, we do have this opportunity now to do that. So with that, we do have some questions for you, and I'm going to start with, um, I'd be interested to hear what you think are the biggest challenges facing local authorities, and would you agree with the Accounts Commission that tackling inequalities and addressing the effects of poverty are some of the biggest challenges facing the local, local authorities? And I, and I did hear you say that this is um, you know, one of the most important things, is tackling child poverty, but if you could just share a little bit more about that, that would be great. Oh, um, thanks very much, um, convener, and can I just... Um, agree with, first of all, your remarks earlier about the opportunities that joining up all these areas provides. And as a committee, I do think you have a, a great opportunity to, to pull together the, the various strands and to, to look at how uh, we um, work uh, as a, a government, not, not just in my portfolio, I should hasten to add, I think it's important across the whole of government. And that's why on child poverty, I um, have tasked my cabinet colleagues to tell me what more they can do within their portfolios to uh, leave no stone unturned to look at game-changing policies that they can uh, deliver within their own portfolio areas to make sure this is a cross-government effort. Um, and not just cross-government, it has to be with local government, third sector. Uh, all of us have to work together if we're going to get anywhere near those interim uh, child poverty targets, which, as I said in my opening remarks, are very challenging. Um, I do agree with the, the Accounts Commission that there is a, a still a significant amount of progress to be made in reducing inequalities and uh, protecting human rights. And we've agreed, as I said earlier, an, a national uh, mission to ch tackle child poverty and remain firmly committed uh, to, to that. And it will take all of us working together uh, to do that. Um, we are working particularly with COSLA, with Public Health Scotland and the third sector to identify how we can support and embed positive changes uh, made as a result of the crisis, some uh, changes that 
you know, we want to um, make permanent, we don't want to go back to some of the old ways of working, um, and we need to deliver further progress on our Fairer Scotland ambition. I meet with COSLA on a regular basis, and we are working with the Deputy First Minister around the COVID recovery plan, which, of course, local government is at the heart of. So, hopefully, that gives you a kind of flavour of the, the, the kind of key elements that, that we are working on and taking forward. Thank you very much. I'd like to call on my colleague Eleanor Whittam for the next question. Thanks very much, Convener, and good morning, Cabinet Secretary and colleagues. Um, I would just like to refer um, members to my Register of Interests. I am still currently a cur uh, serving councillor at East Ayrshire Council. Um, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Can I ask you your views on the role of local government in Scotland's economic recovery from the pandemic? What actions are required and how can these be done in such a way that it does not further impact on inequalities? You know, we know that there's been a heavily gendered impact from, from the pandemic. So just your views on that would be welcome. Thank you. Uh, yeah, well, first of all, I absolutely um, agree that the pandemic has impacted on everyone, but not everyone equally. And we know that those who were uh, most impacted by poverty before the pandemic have been the hardest hit. And of course, you point out a, a gendered analysis of the, the pandemic as well. There's a lot of evidence to show that has, has been the case um, so we need to take the, all of that into account in terms of the COVID recovery plan. We see local government as um, a key part of the uh, economic recovery. Um, we provided uh, local government with uh, an additional £1.5 billion pounds in direct support through the local government finance settlement over and above the regular grant payments for COVID recovery. And it's important that we deliver a, a bold and ambitious recovery plan um, within government. The priority is to work collectively to ensure that that is the case. And, uh, the Deputy First Minister is leading engagement to really strengthen our partnership with local government in order to support that recovery and maximise the, the benefit for our citizens. Uh, in discussions with local government and partners, we have stressed the importance of learning from and encouraging ongoing participation from local communities, listening to, to people. I think one of the things that struck me most of all was the local community resilience that we have seen, people really supporting one another. We want to harness that going forward. So, Working with partners uh, in COSLA and with local government more widely is going to be an important focus of our work with communities as part of the COVID recovery plan, and I'm sure the, the Deputy First Minister will um, keep the committee um, furnished with the, the detail of that going forward. Thanks. Thank you very much for your response. I have a wee further question on that. Um, if we think about um, local economies and we think about the huge spending power that councils have, um, how can the government support councils to, to um, be enabled um, to, to have community wealth building locally? Um, could that be done through reforms to, to procurement? Um, there's a huge amount of, of spend um, in, in local um, authorities' budgets. Um, so could you um, talk a little bit about that for us, please? Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. Um, and community wealth building has become a very strong concept, something that uh, has been tried in, in other countries, but something we're very committed to doing. I think the spending power of, of local government is is huge, um, and that is important for local communities. It's important for local jobs, and local services. Um, I think the 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 way we have um, they pushed the the the, the ourselves um, in the the, the um, agreement that is um, you'll be well aware of that we have gone a, a bit further than previously on the issue of procurement, and I think that's quite. Right, um, the issue of conditionality in terms of making sure that there is uh, as much kind of local benefit from uh, procurement and making sure that um, there are conditions placed around fair, the Fair Work Agenda, for example, uh, in terms of um, contracts that are, are let. So I think all of that will help to make sure that where possible wealth is kept within communities, and that's something um, as the Cabinet Secretary for Social Justice, I am very keen to work with my government colleagues to, to make happen. Thank you 
Cabinet Secretary for your responses to those questions and I'll now call on Megan Gallagher. Thank you very much, Convener. Um, good morning, Cabinet Secretary and colleagues. Um, before I ask my question this morning, um, I would also like to refer to my register of interests as I am a serving councillor in North Lanarkshire Council. Um, Cabinet Secretary, councils, community groups and third party organisations went above and beyond during the pandemic and over the last 18 months. And I think there were many examples throughout Scotland in terms of good collegiate working between them all. And that's where my um, question relates to this morning. Morning. Um, how can the Scottish Government help to ensure the spirit of partnership and innovation shown by local authorities and community groups over the past year is built upon and public bodies don't simply resort to business as usual? I think that's a really important uh, question and you know there is a danger that um, we all go back into silos and that would be a really negative thing. So we've got to work hard to make sure we don't. We've got to do that in government and lead by example and make sure that we are working uh, as much as we can uh, across government. I spoke earlier about the way we are working across government to tackle child poverty. It's not just um, my job to do that, it's everybody's job. So leading by example is important. I think also building on the recommendations of the Social Renewal Advisory Board, we're looking to ensure that going forward, um, the lessons from the pandemic are not lost, but rather inform our approach going forward. I, I met with the board last week and talked uh, through uh, with them how many of their recommendations have now found their way into uh, government policy ambition. And that is um, really good because their recommendations were um, challenging, but quite rightly challenging. In our work with local government, we want to focus on a, a community-based approach to COVID recovery and sustain many of the good examples of community initiatives that arose during the pandemic and which can you know, really support individuals in our communities. I guess that's what we envisaged when the Community Empowerment Scotland Act 2015 was, was uh, passed to enable much greater community participation and engagement. And it will be central to the government's response in supporting organisations to make a meaningful impact on their communities. So I think we have um, the opportunity to do that, but um, we need to work at it to make sure that that happens. It's not going to happen on its own. And my discussions with COSLA, I know they feel the same, that we have to really, really work that can-do mentality where things that perhaps seem to take a long time to achieve previously, um, barriers were swept away. And uh, that can-do attitude was really to the fore. We really want to maintain that to make sure that we can make progress uh, in the recovery phase. Thank you. Thank you for that, Cabinet Secretary. Um, I'm actually minded to ask a little supplementary question on that. Um, you, you, what kinds of things, you know, you talked about, um, you know, the, the barriers to things were swept away and that we need to make sure that this can-do attitude um, stays in place, but that it's going to take work. But what, what kinds of things do you think we could do um, to make sure that, that we do keep that partnership working and we do... Um, support the can-do attitude at a community level? I think it's recognising um, if silos begin to emerge again or uh, you know, bureaucracy and barriers begin to emerge, that we challenge that. Um, we need to challenge ourselves. It's really easy just to fall back into old ways of working. So we need to be open about that. And we need to, as a committee, you know, you're, I'm sure um, you you have a role in, in doing that as well, as do we in government and, and local government. We need to do a kind of check on ourselves, I think, um, and really try to you know, make sure that, that, that we don't. I think communities um, want to lead and do stuff for themselves, and there is a lot of legislation and policy in place to help make that happen. But sometimes letting go of, of power can be quite a, a difficult thing for all of us. But I think for community, when you look at what communities have achieved when they've taken over assets and buildings and things like that, they've managed to turn around 
things that, you know, with the best will in the world, sometimes statutory agencies just weren't able to. There's something very special about that community um, ownership and model um, that's inspiring. Uh, so I think we need to see more of that. Where, where communities want to do that, they shouldn't be forced to, obviously, but where there's a desire for communities to want to, to, to do that, um, they should be empowered to do that and we should support them. Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to move on to a question from Paul McClellan. Yeah, thank you, convener, and welcome, Cabinet Secretary and, and colleagues. Can uh, I also refer to my register of interests? I'm uh, an existing councillor in East Lothian. Cabinet Secretary, you mentioned obviously around about local government's role in economic recovery and building community resilience, which is, of course is, is vitally important. Can I ask you about Scottish Government's response to Causes Blueprint for Local Government, which was published last year, and in, in particular in longer term certainty in relation to budgets to focus on early uh, intervention? And prevention? Yeah, well, uh, early intervention and pre in prevention is always um, better than trying to then deal with the consequences um, of poverty um, or homelessness further down the line. So, yes, and I think you'll see early intervention and prevention built into all of our policies. However, we need to get better at it. Um, for, I think we've been talking for a long time about you know investing upstream uh, is the best way to invest to prevent problems emerging, but it's quite hard to do that because you're at the same time clearly trying to keep services running while you're trying to change services and um, uh, transform them um, into to different ways. If you look back at the Christie recommendations. It was very clear from that that the, the recommendation, one of the key recommendations, was to invest in prevention and early intervention and up and upstream. Um, and we need to work out ways of making that easier. Um, so, if you're at the moment, we are in discussions with uh, COSLA and local government to look at how we can help services make that transition. Uh, that and it's an easy thing to say, a harder thing to do. So, uh, you know, one of the um, areas that we're looking to continue to fund is the Tom Hunter Foundation, where they've been looking at some quite exciting um, transformational change, and they bring funding as well to the table, which is always welcome. So, we've been partnering with them with some of our own funding, and it's really to oil the wheels of change, so to help. Um, to get from A to B uh, or, and to make that service change. Um, you can't do that overnight and you have to invest in some of that bridging, if you like, to, to transform a service. So I'm, I'm really keen to see more of that. Um, to tackle child poverty, we absolutely need to uh, tackle the causes of child poverty. Some of that is systemic. There is not one single solution. We need to do all of that. Um, so early intervention prevention is, is absolutely key, and we need to, where possible, try to um, sh to to push the spend in that direction. But as I say, it's easy to say; it's a lot harder to do when you're also trying to keep services going on a day-to-day -day basis while you make that transition. Can I just ask one quick supplementary? Can I share? I met with uh, E Dash yesterday, who represent economic development professionals. And one of the things they were talking about was obviously the role of economic development units within local authorities. I'm wondering if there's anything you can say around about how we can enhance their roles, because I think they're big facilitators in, 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 in economic recovery. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I would like to look at that in a bit more detail. Um, if you want to, to write to me with, with some of the, the detail around that, I would be happy to look specifically at you know, whether or not there's more we can do around that that support for, for EDAS. Um, I mean, local government has always had a key economic development role. Um, and you know, in the COVID recovery, that role is going to be even more important. So um, if there's more we can do to support the the, the capacity and the, um, the those on the front line who have that expertise in local government, then that's something I'm certainly uh, happy to, to look at along with my cabinet colleagues. But perhaps if you want to to, to drop me a, an email about that, and we can I can look at it in more detail. Thank you. Thank you for that. And I would like to move over to Willie Coffey with uh, another question. 
Thanks very much, Convener, and good morning, Cabinet Secretary. I wonder if you could share a few words with the Committee, Cabinet Secretary, on the National Care Service consultation that's going on. Um, as you know, um, Scotland's councils will will implement the National Care Services, but COSLA, through their president, who we'll hear from shortly, is saying that this really means that we'll lose substantial autonomy locally, and in fact, she's described it as a, an attack on localism. Could you address some of these concerns for the committee, please, and explain how you would propose to resolve some of these concerns uh, going forward? Well, well, thanks for the question. I mean, obviously, the, the lead minister on this is, is Kevin Stewart, and you, you know he he will be able to engage with you uh, a bit more about this. But let me address some of the, the key points. Um, I, I guess I feel quite um, close to this personally, given uh, my my previous role in in government. But also, I used to be a home care manager working uh, within a local authority for many years, uh, and. I have to say, I think it's a system that um, what is badly needing reform. Re you know, reforms have been tried in terms of the integration agenda, and good things have happened from that in terms of the work between local government and uh, the NHS and third sector becoming far closer. But without a doubt, if you speak to stakeholders, they they are very clear about the weaknesses in, in the current system. So. The creation of the National Care Service, you'll be aware, is one of the most significant public service reforms that has been mooted for, for decades. Um, and the Independent Review of Adult Social Care did recommend the creation of a National Care Service, um, with Scottish ministers being accountable for adult social care support. So it's you know this isn't something that's just been dreamt up by the Scottish Government. This has come from a series of, of uh, discussions and reports. Um, at the end of the day, what's important here is the outcomes, and we want a, a system that supports people uh, to uh, not just survive, but to be empowered to thrive. Um, and we want a national care service that uh, can oversee um, consistency of uh, delivery of care to improve standards, ensure enhanced paying conditions for workers, and that's not um, insignificant given the recruitment and retention issues that there are within uh, social care. So we have established a, a social uh, covenant steering group, which is made up of people with lived experience, which is very important in itself to ensure the new service is designed around the needs of care users and supports uh, the needs of care workers. Um, and it's important that the National Care Service defines the strategic direction and quality standards uh, for uh, social care in Scotland. Um, it is going to have local delivery boards, which will work with NHS, local authorities, the third and independent sectors to plan, mission, deliver the support. Um, and the consultation that was launched on the, the 9th of August I think, remains open until the beginning of November. I think it is vital that we hear the views of as many people as possible, including local government. And local government will be a, a key a key partner uh, in making this happen. Now, I am aware of, of COSLA's position on this, and uh, you know, I guess it, it's um, one where we may not ever agree on the principle of it. I don't know. I hope we, we might get to a position of that, but I certainly hope that we can work together on the implementation. This is something that is incredibly popular with stakeholders. Um, and actually, many of those working on the front line of social care as well. We can't continue with the system that we have at the moment. I feel personally very strongly about that, um, and uh, we need something different that ensures consistency of standards and making sure that delivery delivers for people, uh, and not um, that the, the system delivers for people rather than the other, or people having to fit into a system. So. Those are a few observations um, that I hope um, give you a flavour of, of the government's position. But you know, we have got work to do with COSLA to try and, um, as far as we can, uh, overcome any concerns that they have. Do you see there being a possibility of extending the, the consultative period, though? I think COSLA are also saying that it's a pretty short time scale to to introduce the idea and the consultation process has been a little bit narrow. 
Uh, is it possible that the government might consider extending the consultation deadline? Well, look, that will be a judgment for Kevin Stewart, who is the, the minister leading on this, rather than for me. Um, I mean, I think what's important is that that you know people do get the, the not just COSLA, but stakeholders and those who receive social care are voices that we absolutely want to hear from. Um, we're not starting from scratch. We've had you know lots of discussion on this. There's been a lot of parliamentary. Uh, debates over over the years uh, about this, there was a lot of consensus, I think, in uh, the manifestos leading up to the election that you know business as usual uh, and the current models of social care were just not going to cut the mustard. So we needed to do something different. So I think there is a level of consensus. The the detail is important though, and how this is taken forward and how this is implemented matters. It's a big change, and it has to be got right. But I do feel. That if we get this right, it could be one of the most important reforms that this Parliament has has ever uh, supported and 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 implemented. Okay, thanks for that. Thank you. Thank you for that. I'm just going to invite Miles Briggs with a supplementary question on that. Th thank you, Convener. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary, and to your officials as well. I just wanted to follow on um, a line of questioning which um, Willie Coffey took forward there, because as the Cabinet Secretary responsible for local government round. Uh, the cabinet table. Is it your principle that during this parliament, local government will have um, more powers, not fewer, and that local government will also have more control over budgets, or is that something you're willing to see centralised to the Scottish Parliament? Well, at, these, at the end of the day, for me, what matters is outcomes and where power lies and how that's exercised. I think is um, is about what the best outcomes are. Uh, my cabinet colleagues, particularly Kate Forbes, as the, the finance cabinet secretary, is in very detailed discussions with COSLA about, you know, are there um, ways of, of um, making um, their uh, their lives easier when it comes to, you know, ring fence budgets, for example, or are there ways that local government, some of their asks around revenue raising, all of these things will be under consideration um, to make sure that local government. Um, you know, can exercise its its functions in the way that it it wants to. Local autonomy is important, but um, it does strike me that sometimes um, in Parliament, and I've I've been asked this as well quite often. Uh, I'll be uh, you know have demands to me that we should have a, a national approach to things that currently thirty two local authorities decide upon. Uh, other times it will be criticism that you know local. A government should be given the, the autonomy to make decisions. These are not always easy things to balance. I think, though, we should focus on the outcomes and what the best outcomes for, for communities and, and people that are served, and wherever the power lies uh, to deliver that, that probably should be our guiding principle, I think. Thank you for that. Um, we're going to change themes a little bit and move to housing, and I'm going to invite Megan Gallagher with a first question. Thank you, Convener. Um, with your permission, I'd like to ask two questions. On the Scottish Government's housing plans and the route map to housing to 2040 strategy, um, the first question relates to communities and the active role they can play on the development of their area. How will the Scottish Government ensure that happens? And the second question relates to short-term lets, as various organisations have raised concerns in relation to proposed regulation and the impact this could have on rural and urban economy, tourism and additional pressures that businesses will experience. Um, I would be interested to hear the Cabinet Secretary's views on the concerns that have been raised and if an update can be provided to committee on the Scottish Government's engagement with stakeholders. Uh, okay, uh, well, thanks uh, for that. those questions. Uh, the first question uh, about housing to, to 2040 um, is, um, is important. I, I must say that um, when I came into post, uh, one of the first documents I looked at was housing to 2040. And I was in, I knew the, the kind of high level um, elements of it, but reading it in detail, it is a really, really good long-term housing strategy that gives us the the route map to some very significant changes uh, over a longer period. So it doesn't do the kind of five-year parliamentary uh, terms. It, it really takes that longer-term approach, and that is really critical if we're going to 
deliver the, uh, the, 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 for the housing needs of, of Scotland. Um, our, our aim is, is really to create, help create places um, for people. It's not just about bricks and mortar, it's about uh, creating uh, places that people want to, to live in, but also where people can, can work bring up families, um, have their, their leisure time. And we know from our work with communities that um, things like good design really matters. Um, and we're committed to the community-led design work, um, the design version of the play standard um, that we're launching um, this new tool later this year to, to help that happen. We're also establishing the place-based investment programme this year. Um, it's a £325 million Times investment over five years, which will contribute to our ambitions in community-led regeneration, community wealth building, town centre revitalisation, and the concept of 20-minute neighbourhoods, where essentially you will be able to, you know, get to your uh, your leisure facilities, shopping facilities, and where possible places of work uh, to be able to, um, you know, access those rather than having to um, go. Uh, to travel uh, long distances. Um, your second question was on uh, short-term let. Um, now, you know, we have been um, consulting for quite some time on this, and uh, that is important that we continue uh, to do that. Um, we have um, been trying to make sure that uh, we listen to stakeholders' views um, as much as possible. And the working group, although we lost some uh, members of the working group, which you know um, was unfortunate, I've had a series of discussions with those stakeholders uh, since then, and I have um, had um, very productive discussions with them. And indeed, they have said that you know they will continue to work with us around the. The detail and the implementation issues. Not that they will necessarily agree with us on everything, and in fact, I think uh, those who left the, the working group were mainly proponents of a, a registration scheme rather than a licensing scheme. Um, but um, nevertheless, I certainly they, they signal that they were wanting to continue to work with us, even if they don't agree with some of the the, the key elements uh, of the, the proposals. I think they want to make sure the implementation is got right. So I, I welcome that. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, um, the the important element of um, the short term lets is to make sure that there is a, um, a, 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 a kind of even and consistent approach to safety standards. Uh, across short-term lets. Um, that has been important. The issue was raised initially by concerns of residents and communities of, across Scotland and indeed members of the Scottish Parliament. Um, and at the heart of our licensing scheme is a, a set of mandatory standards which I think will help to protect the safety of guests and neighbours in all types of short-term lets across Scotland. Um, I wrote to the committee saying that we would um, Put the um, we would come to Parliament with the, the, the legislation in November because we had um, over a thousand responses to the, the consultation, the latest consultation, and it's important that we give those uh, due consideration. And as I said at the beginning of my maybe rather long answer now to you, um, you know I want to listen to stakeholders. Um, but we we will stick by our principle of a licensing system. But if there's changes we can make around the implementation, and we already have done, for example, on the energy efficiency requirements, we removed that because we thought it might be um, onerous and listen to stakeholders on that. But you know we we want to to go ahead with this, but we also want to make sure that it is not uh, onerous and not difficult for uh, for people who. Um, will ha have to implement these changes uh, to, to do so. Thank you for that, Cabinet Secretary. And then we're going to keep with the housing theme and with some questions from Eleanor Whitt Whittam. Thanks very much, Convener. I'd um, like to shift now onto the Affordable Housing Supply Programme. So we know that Scottish Council share in the ambitious um, target of delivering 50,000 um, affordable homes over the next five-year term, and we know that they've, you know, very warmly welcomed the five-year resource planning assumptions um, that gives them some 
certainty over their plans. But what evidence does the Scottish Government have about the increasing costs of building new homes and the extent to which this might affect the progress of um, the, the programme? And also, how will this be monitored and reviewed across the next five years? Thanks. Uh, well, uh, thanks for the, the welcome of the, the recent allocation of the, the five-year uh, resource planning assumptions. I think that gives further confidence to partners and strengthens the, the certainty of delivering uh, future affordable homes commitments and allows the, the sector the time to, to build the necessary, necessary capacity to plan and deliver um, what, what is an ambitious number of uh, affordable uh, homes. So um, you know, we will uh, continue uh, to work with uh, partners in doing that. Um, in terms of materials, um, you make uh, uh, an important point uh, about that. Um, I mean, essentially, uh, we are aware, as you would expect, of uh, concerns around price increases and supply shortages of construction materials, and we're working closely with the construction industry through the Construction Leadership Forum, chaired by uh, Ivan McKee, who is uh, obviously the Minister for Business, Trade, Tourism and Enterprise. And we want to make sure we fully understand the current supply chain issues and, where possible, we could put in place mitigating actions to address the issues that are being identified. I am um, getting very close, as you would expect, uh, in regard to material cost increases and availability and the impact uh, on the affordable housing supply programme going forward. I meet regularly with uh, local authorities and uh, RSLs to discuss these matters and to make sure that we support them in delivering what is a very uh, ambitious target. But I am confident that uh, you know, we can work through these issues and make sure that we continue to uh, deliver um, the 100, now 110,000 affordable homes. Thank you very much for that answer. Um, and I would like to ask what progress has been made with the review of grant subsidy benchmarks um, and whether there will still be a differential between councils and RSLs. Um, and are they be confident that the revised benchmarks will allow councils um, to meet you know, our shared ambitions between Scottish Government um, and local authorities to tackle um, poverty, inequality and homelessness and climate change. Thanks. Yes, um, I mean, obviously there's been uh, ongoing uh, discussion uh, uh, around this. They, uh, first of all, I think it's important to, to recognise that the affordable housing investment benchmark assumptions are, own, are used only to determine the appraisal route that an application for grant funding follows, and they're not grant rates or grant ceilings, and uh, therefore they shouldn't have any impact on council events or RSL rent setting processes. So I think it's important to, to say that. Um, also, when determining the, the level of grant uh, funding they need to apply for in order to deliver projects, the Councils and RSLs need to be comfortable with the, the level of borrowing that they plan to take on, uh, as well as being satisfied that tenants' rents remain uh, affordable. Um, I really much acknowledge the issues that have been raised during the review, and um, uh, we've, um, the most recent proposal is resulting in a significant closing of the gap between Council and RSL baseline benchmark assumptions, with the same uh, additional benchmarks being proposed for the elements of higher quality that are being phased into the programme, so for example, on zero emission heating systems. Um, however, I'm, um, um, I intend to, to hold firm um, and maintain a, a baseline differential between the councils and RSL benchmarks, primarily because of the different borrowing opportunities that are open to councils and RSLs when delivering affordable housing through the programme. Um, so I think that's important to recognise that. But also finally, you know, I will um, you know, want to consider COSLA's overall feedback on the group's work when deciding the outcome of the review and um, um, you know we'll we'll be considering that in, in due course. But hopefully that gives you a kind of flavour of um, and hopefully that gives you an, an answer to your question. 
Thank you very much for that, Cabinet Secretary. And I just, uh, it's not really a supplementary question, but I'm just, because of the interest of time, I'm just going to flag up a bit because I've got the Highlands and Islands perspective. I'm really aware that um, having travelled to the islands over the recess, that, you know, there's massive issues with housing there. Um, and so I'm just kind of like flagging it up, and I think at some point we will we'll kind of raise that with you because it's clearly much more expensive to build housing there. And then there are also issues around land and 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 skills, you know, labour. Um, and I'm deeply concerned that you know we need to make sure that the 11,000 affordable housing, you know, housing that we've got earmarked for the islands is, uh, you know, that we put a good consideration into how those come about. Um, I'd like to move well, on. Uh, yeah. yeah. Go on. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> oh, I was just going to say that, um, yeah, I would be happy to, to write to the committee with more detail on that. Obviously, the agreement uh, had additional monies of £45 million, pounds in addition, obviously, to the affordable housing SPI programme and a commitment to 10 per cent of the 110,000 homes being located within remote and rural communities, plus a plan that is dedicated to remote and rural housing. So, you know, I would be happy to come back and discuss that in, in detail with the committee if you would find that helpful. Thank you very much for that. And we're going to move on to still sticking with um, housing, bringing in the theme of homelessness as well. Um, I'm calling on the, my colleague, Miles Briggs. Thank you, Camina. I wanted to raise a couple of uh, specific questions. Um, it's waiting for my mic to come on. Perfect. It's on. It's on. <laughs> Third time lucky. <laughs> um, I wanted to raise a couple of specific questions, uh, Cabinet Secretary, with regards to um, what I think all of us would welcome, which, which was around the emergency response during the pandemic to, to rough sleeping and homelessness, and specifically uh, what considerations uh, around the proposals for legislative changes to improve homelessness prevention the Scottish Government is looking out at currently and what might be brought forward during this session of Parliament um, as set out in the final report of the Prevention Review Group. Uh, yeah, well, you, may, you make a good point that um, you know, one of the um, aspects of the pandemic that is referred to quite a lot was the ability for us to respond and agencies to respond to tackle rough sleeping uh, during the pandemic and essentially make sure people were kept uh, safe. Um, and that was obviously a, a very, very important thing, particularly at the, the, the height of the pandemic. Um, the action plan is uh, you know, commits to uh, placing greater emphasis on the prevention of homelessness, accelerating the shift to rapid rehousing and ending the use of night shelters uh, and dormitory style provision. Um, we pledged an extra £50 million to end homelessness and, and rough sleeping. And as you referred to, we also introduced legislation that strengthens people's housing rights and ensures the public bodies have a, a duty to prevent uh, homelessness. Um, the issue of temporary accommodation um, is maybe just worth mentioning here as well, because I know um, you've had an interest, and I'm sure the committee also has got an, an interest uh, in this. And um, your temporary accommodation was uh, used uh, a, a lot during the pandemic, again, to keep people safe. And there has been a bit of a lag um, with landlords being able to, to move people um, through uh, temporary accommodation to settled accommodation uh, because of the ability to turn houses around, and there was obviously a delay in that. Um, and I'm, you know, bit, we're working very closely with local authorities and supporting them individually to try and make sure that uh, where temporary accommodation is used, that it is always suitable temporary accommodation. And um, we know that for some local authorities, that is a, a, quite a challenge, but we are working with them to look at how we make sure that we, we tackle that. Happy to write to the committee again with more detail um, on all of that, if that would be helpful. Thank, thank you for that answer. There was um, Shelter Scotland put forward um, a pledge around annual housing and social justice reporting, and wondered if whether or not uh, the Scottish Government were looking at that um, to look to produce um, a report to Parliament to, to, for us to be able to benchmark um, how progress around social house buildings 
actually taking place across Scotland and for that to be wider and um, to include marginalized groups as well um, so specifically I wanted to ask around um, what assessments and, and benchmarking the government will be taking forward um, and how can the committee play a role in that well, I, I'm happy to consider um, the, the reporting, um, you know, in, in, in terms of in, in addition to all the, the reports and the statistics that that, that come out. Um, there's no no lack of information, but if the committee would find it helpful for us to pull that together in a way that kind of gives a, a kind of single place for the kind of key points, um, then you know, I'm happy to do that. I wonder if um, maybe Caroline might want to come in at this point, or, um, or I don't know, Caroline, if you'd be the most appropriate person just to talk a little bit about the benchmarks. Yeah, sure. Yeah, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Um, there's, there's already, as you've said, a, a wide range of evidence that's collected. So the Scottish Government's Centre for Housing Market Analysis supports local authorities in terms of looking at housing need and demand assessments. Um, there's also a, a range of other publications, such as Social Tenants in Scotland statistics, and um, there's also information that comes in from um, the annual reports from the Scottish Household Survey. So, um, as Cabinet Secretary has said, we can provide the committee with more details on some of those data sources, if that would be helpful. Um, also, in terms of Housing to 2040, the, the strategy um, that has been discussed earlier, um, there is also um, a consideration of the governance process and reporting and monitoring framework that will sit alongside that strategy. And this will be established later this year um, after there has been a discussion with key stakeholders. So, if the report that has been mentioned is something that stakeholders would like taken into account, then that obviously can be, be added in. Um, and the, the strategy itself does set out um, the need to respond to emerging challenges and changing context, and also to identify where changes might be needed going forward. Thank you for that, Caroline. Um, I'm going to move to Mark Griffin. Thanks, Kevin. I just draw members' attention to my register of interest as an owner of a uh, rented property in North Lanarkshire Council area. Um, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Can I just ask um, if you're able to give a, a flavour of what might be included in the new um, rented sector strategy consultation and when uh, a kind of an indicative timetable of when we might see legislation in Parliament? Yeah, so happy uh, to, to do that. Um, the rented sector strategy, um, I think, will build on what is hopefully you would also agree are some significant progress in improving standards and tenants' rights over the years. I've been really quite in a collective endeavour by Parliament over some uh, time. So we're committed to a public consultation um, early next year, which will include plans for a uh, a new housing regulator for the private rented sector for new and strengthened tenants' rights, uh, greater restrictions on evictions over winter, and uh, additional penalties for uh, illegal evictions. Um, we want to uh, make sure that um, we can uh, deliver enhanced uh, tenants' rights, but we want to consult stakeholders on the detail. Of that, um, any legislative issues emerging from the rented sector strategy will then be um, able to be picked up by a housing bill in the second year of this parliamentary session. It seemed to me a kind of logical uh, way to do it. So you'll consult on the strategy of the final strategy published later in 2022, and thereafter looking at any legislative changes that would be required through um, the. Um, a housing bill. Uh, or you, I don't know whether you want me to maybe say something um, on rent controls. Um, clearly, that has been uh, an issue that has, is part of the agreement with the, the Scottish Green Party, and we want to 
um, consult on what a system of rent controls would look like and ensure there's sufficient local flexibility uh, in terms of taking that forward. So that in itself is quite a, a big piece of work and we uh, will be taking that forward as well. Something I know that um, your uh, colleagues have been quite interested in too. Thanks, Cabinet Secretary. I appreciate that answer. I wonder if you were to set out um, the level of work that's going on to um, essentially develop a, a data set. What, one of the big frustrations when it's come to policy around particularly the private rented sector, um, private rented sector is around um, rent levels, um, rent level increases, length of tenancies data like that. I wonder um, what work is going on to essentially establish a, a comprehensive data set that's regularly updated to inform that policy work. Yeah, I mean, you, you're absolutely right that, um, so if, in terms of um, looking at the issue of rent uh, controls, uh, you need to have a, a starting point on better data in the private rented sector to be able to deliver uh, an effective uh, system. Um, we're going to set out our intentions about how we're going to do this by the end of this year, and um, this work's going to be taking forward in step, in tandem with the new rented sector strategy, with both elements being consulted on in, in early 2022. I mean, there are various uh, options um, to look at in terms of where how that data is gathered, um, but um, you know, it, it's a big piece of work, uh, not easy. Um, I'm not sure we can rely necessarily on the current sources of, of data that are available. Um, but it is something that is uh, a key priority in order to have an effective system of rent controls. You need, you need the data to be able to, to do that. So work is, officials are working very, very hard uh, on this. And again, I'm happy to provide the committee with a, a, a more detailed answer once um, uh, you, as a follow up to, to this session. Thanks. And just finally, if I can just ask about affordability. There doesn't seem to be a, an agreed definition across almost all sectors of, of housing as to what actually uh, is an affordable home. Um, I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary can set out what work is going on essentially to have a, a common a, agreed definition of what a, an affordable home is. Yeah, um, you're absolutely right, um, and it's actually probably more complex than um, you know just simply in terms of kind of ratio to uh, to, to income and, and cost. Um, so that that work is going on to try and agree um, across the the, the system uh, and a, and a, uh, an agreed definition of affordability to give it more sophistication than it currently has. So um, that work is ongoing. Again, happy to furnish the committee with more details as that work progresses. Um, we want to try and get an agreed position across uh, all of the all of the the, um, the the RSLs and local authorities um, going forward. Um, so yeah, work work in progress. Thank you. Hard to see the red light. Thank you very much for that, Cabinet Secretary. So we do have other questions, but in the interest of time, I'm going to close now, and we will um, put a letter together to you um, of the remaining ones. Some very important issues around, um, you know, reducing emissions around home building, for example, and we're also interested around how local authorities will be affected by the levelling up schemes. But we'll put that in writing to you um, in the next few days. So thank you so much uh, for you coming and giving evidence today. I think it's been very helpful for us to get a kind of baseline of understanding of what your priorities are for us to carry on our scrutiny in the coming session. Thank, thank you very much for the opportunity and look forward to meeting with you again. And now I'm going to briefly suspend the meeting before we move to the next panel.
Right, all right, so let's get back in. Um, we'll now move to our second panel of witnesses this morning, and we'll be hearing from COSLA. And I'd like to warmly welcome Councillor Alison Evanson, President, and Sarah Waters, Director of Membership and Resources. And I'd like to invite Councillor Evanson to give us some opening remarks. Thank you very much, convener. And, um, I'm glad to be here in front of the committee today. Delighted to have this opportunity to follow up on COSLA's recent written response to the Local Government's Housing Planning Committee's request for views on those, on those COSLA priorities which sit within the co committee's remit. I understand that the breadth of the committee's remit and COSLA's response has considered that in its whole. Just a quick word on COSLA itself. Obviously, COSLA is a membership organization, including all 32 local councils. We are organized into six into boards, which are represented by spokespeople, covering all aspects of local government's work. The spokespeople and the presidential team of COSLA are mandated by these boards and by our leaders to speak on behalf of local government on our agreed policy priorities and positions. Local government obviously then covers a huge range of services, many of which are covered more specifically by other Scottish parliamentary committees than your own, though you will appreciate that in the interest of joined up working, much of the information we share our view has been or may be also shared with other committees upon request at various times. Central to the work that lies ahead for us all are COSLA's priorities for the recovery period. These are set out in COSLA's blueprint for local government, which I'm glad to have also already heard referenced this morning. But just to refresh, the blueprint is framed around six key themes. Strengthening local democracy, funding services and communities, well-being, including health and social care, education and children and young people, economy in the environment, and supporting vulnerable communities. COSLA and our councils have an integral, integral role in Scotland's recovery moving forward and are ready to work as partners with the Scottish Government as part of that re essential recovery work. Local government is the anchor in our communities. However, to underpin the work that COS the councils want to do, proper funding will be paramount. And I'm looking forward to discussing our thoughts on this fundamental issue during our discussion today. I am pleased to have with me today my colleague, COSLA's Director for Membership and Resources, Sarah Waters, who will help to convey our position on the financial issues. Between us, we will add to the information you have on other specific areas of interest as far as we are able. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, and uh, we, we do have a range of questions, and I'll, I'll start by asking, um, Given COSA's role in representing the in interests of local government in Scotland, what would you like to see this committee focus on over the parliamentary session? And also, you know, we are keen as a committee to play a role in helping people understand and appreciate the importance of local government. So anything that you would like to kind of add in there to support us in thinking well about how we can do that would be very much appreciated. Thank you, convener. Yes, COSLA is the voice of local government across Scotland. As I said, we have all 32 councils members and we are working on a democratic basis. So we represent the views of local government and we have that voice across Scotland. And obviously a, a key aspect as we move forward is recovery. And our vision for recovery, our vision for moving forward is set out very clearly in our blueprint. And it shows that the need to have that local democratically empowered voice um, to, to deliver that recovery. Scotland's recovery is what we need to address moving forward. We have already worked to uh, de define through the local governance review what is essential components of that. And we've talked about fiscal empowerment, we've talked about community empowerment, and we've been talking about functional empowerment as three key aspects of working together to deliver recovery across our communities. So 
that I think is the focus of what we're looking at. The fiscal empowerment has to be absolutely key in what we're doing because none of these services, none of this prevention work we've been talking about can be delivered. We, we can't value the workforce we want to, to value in the way that, that they deserve uh, to be valued unless we have that fiscal empowerment moving forward. So that must be key to what we're, we're doing. As a committee, in, in, uh, my my, my ask of the committee itself would be, be to help us develop that partnership work with the Scottish Government because we do need to work together if we are going to achieve these things and to help us achieve that, that, um, that standing between us which is so important. It, and and on another, just a, a final comment as well, what's important is that our councillors work directly within their local communities. They step up and are part of their, their communities. You obviously got on your committee. People will know exactly what I'm talking about there because they serve as councillors as well. They are part of their communities. They, they live in those communities. They represent the communities and they are the voice of their community on the local, local council as well. So just to emphasize that point, you know, we are closest to our communities and we represent that voice and many councils themselves have that lived experience is so important. Thank you for that and um, I'm going to move on to uh, questions around the election from Miles Briggs. Um, thank you convener. Good morning uh, Council uh, Everson and uh, Miss Waters as well. Um, I wanted to start by putting on record our committee's thanks to councillors across Scotland. Um, you know, during the pandemic, uh, the additional uh, work and support which they have provided to their communities, I think, is important to recognise. Um, and as we look towards next year's council elections, um, I wanted to ask um, what additional things you think uh, the Scottish Government or Scottish Parliament could be doing to help to encourage higher voter turnout, um, and specifically to encourage um, other people to, to take up the, the challenge of becoming a local councillor? Thank you very much for that question and I'm very grateful for your remarks about our local councillors because you're right, they have the councillors, council staff have together gone beyond over the recent pandemic months to, to serve their communities and work within their communities. Uh, I think two things moving towards the next, next election are really important. That role for local government as that democratic local voice is key and too often I, I think probably other aspects of spheres of government across Scotland as, uh, across the UK as a whole even will recognize this that you know you get publicity on things that aren't, aren't going well and you get all the important services that are going on actually ignored and, and and I think that's something we can all help to promote you might have seen on Fridays for example we have um, Cosmos developed its Fact Fridays in which we're putting out different messages each week about the kind of work that love government is doing the breadth of our services Last week, there was reference to the work done to support violence against women partnerships, for example. And, and all this work is, is crucial part of, co of local government's work. And, and together to help emphasize that is really important. And I think that is, is one way going forward. Something else has uh, uh, been a very important part of my work and any support can given from the committee to, to encourage this would also help is to encourage diversity of people standing forward to represent their communities. We have a situation at the moment where only 29% of councillors across Scotland are women. We have a very poor representation from, from disabled, from ethnic minorities. I know the Scottish Parliament itself has, has, has taken steps forward since their election this year to do things like that. And we need to work on this as well to make sure that we have every sector of our community is represented at the decision-making table because when we've got that we really see the difference it can make so two things I think are important publicize the work that local government does how integral it is to the services the central services to our communities and help us all make sure that we have a greater diversity of people standing for elected office next next year Thank you. That's a very helpful answer. Um, one of the issues I wanted to pursue was around actually remuneration for councillors. And it's one of the issues which people maybe don't want to discuss. But I think since local government was reformed um, to create large awards with three or four members, um, you know, it has become a focus, I know, looking at sort of the age range and information which was gathered during the, the published research in 2018, something which people are doing in later life. Um, so I just wondered if you had any view on that issue specifically around support for the councillors, but also remuneration for the work that they do. Yes, COSLA has actually just conducted a survey of councillors to, to find out um, hours worked, um, 
the, the commitment given and compare that with the remuneration and that those figures that that report from that consultation will be available shortly for the committee and others and we'll be delighted to share with you as, as soon as we are in a position to do that um yes uh, the, the, this is a huge issue that we're finding that's that's putting people off from standing as councillors because it's not a part-time job as you've already described in the work the councillors have to do it is a full-time job but paid on a part-time salary and and so many people cannot afford to step forward and represent their communities because of the remuneration involved we've also discovered that a, a lot of people stand once as a councillor and and discover the, the difficulties in their own life to be able to stay as a councillor and don't stand a second time so we lose so much experience we lose such so much um, knowledge when people only stand once and don't re-stand for election later on. So yes, remuneration for councillors is a huge barrier. And if we are trying to increase the diversity of people standing, this is something we need to stop. You know, we we have, we have people maybe who are reaching retirement age, you know, find it easy to stand as somebody with a young family. And yet we need those people with young families standing as part of our, our council body as well. So again, any support you can give on this really crucial aspect, because um, unfortunately the way things are set up, it has to be the Scottish Parliament decides the remuneration that councils get. We can't decide that ourselves. So any support we can, you can give in Parliament to look at the remuneration of councils, I think will strengthen our democracy and increase that diversity of people standing. Thank you. For that, and I'd like to bring in Eleanor Whittam. Thanks very much, convener, and good morning, President and Sarah. It's lovely to see you both here today. Um, so just exploring a little bit further in terms of the diversity um, that you've already mentioned. So as a former member of COSLA's um, Barriers to Elected Office Working Group, I'm very aware of all the work that's going on in the background by COSLA and councils in general to increase the representation of underrepresented groups within our councils. You've already touched a little bit on it, but I don't know if you want to expand a little bit more on the outputs from that working group with us today. Yes, thank you very much. As you described, we have a working group which is cross-party and, and non, no party as well, the independents as well, involved to try and address the barriers to elected office, to, to try and make sure that by next year we have people from across our communities willing and able to stand for election. Obviously, one aspect of that is, is the remuneration. That's something that we are addressing uh, together through that survey we've just done. Another aspect is the whole culture. And we've done an awful lot of work to, to try and, and change the culture of, of our our councils and, and how people are presented to encourage more people to stand too often people have been able to go into their town halls and look at the pictures on the wall around them and their male people staring down at them. You, know, you don't get that diversity, so you don't get that role model, you don't get that sense of, of I could be one of those, you don't get that sense of inclusion. So that's one important aspect. Something else we've been looking at is, is how councils are operated themselves as a whole and whether there are aspects of operation that are putting people off standing for elected office. And, and looking at this, I always say to people, you know, that, that, that the methods of business the governance we have was put in place to suit a previous demographic. The demographic changes, the, the, the way we do things can also change. It's not tablets of stone stuff. There's ways to change the standing orders, the governance processes within our councils, and that can be all looked at. We've done work as with with the other local government associations across the whole of the UK as well to look at civility in public office. And I think this is something that our colleagues in the parliament will also recognize how off-putting it is when um, you don't get that civil, civility, that respect either from, from other people um, you're working with or from the wider public. And we need together to work together to address that in the way we do our own business, but also the wider and social media and other aspects and be ready together to stamp out and find unacceptable any processes that are unacceptable. So a lot of work we're doing together with others. And we've also done work to touch on, um, touch on family leave to make sure that people who stand for the council can have that family leave that's really important. And we've had various examples of people being able to benefit from that. And again, that's something we need to support from the parliament for as well, because it, it links very mostly with their, um, special responsibility allowances and how people are paid. So we need to, to work with you to, to help develop that process. We, we've developed processes as people have told us their importance. We've also got loan working guidance to encourage people to support people who are working on their own. We've got um, guidance as well for menopause to, to help people uh, 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 
at that age to, to, to be able to, to carry on their work as counsellors with support. And we've recently been working with Inclusion Scotland as well to try and work out in how we can encourage uh, people from uh, who are disabled to be part of the council. So there's lots of work we've done, working with partners across the UK and with the Scottish Parliament as well to try and address this. The work is not finished, it's ongoing, and any support that people can give us with this is obviously gratefully received. Yeah, I'll just um, come back. Sorry, am I on? Yeah. I'll just come back with a wee supplementary to that. And just to put it on record, I think that it you know, goes without saying that under your leadership um, at COSLA, we actually did the first job share um, for a spokesperson, which was never done before. And I think that that allows you know, councils then in their own local authority areas to look at that level um, of change that's maybe you know, an incumbent upon all of us to increase the representation from, from different groups. Um, so just to have that on record, thank you. Thank you for that, Eleanor. I'd like to move to Paul McClellan with some questions. Yeah, thank you, convener, and good morning, President and, and Sarah. Um, President, we had the Accounts Commission with us uh, last week, and we talked around about the challenges, and one of the things they mentioned was around about uh, inequalities. So it was to get your views on that, and I think it's probably been entrenched more in the last 18 months, obviously, with with, with COVID. And, and I think we also talked before when we spoke to the Cabinet Secretary around about, I suppose, building resilience within our, our own communities. And, and what resources do we need to make sure that we're, we've not missed that opportunity, if you like, and how they've stood up in the last 18 months or so. And one final question that I raised with the Cabinet Secretary as well was the role of economic development units. I spoke to EDAS, it, you know, if you listened into the session earlier on, around about the importance of economic development units and how important they're going to be in terms of our economic recovery and just what your views are and what you're hearing from economic development colleagues and, and councils about how we can try and enhance their role. Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. I mean, I, th I think the issue about inequalities is absolutely crucial. Um, inequalities were there anyway. Um, what's happened during the last few months is they've become more pronounced and we've seen them and they've had a more devastating effect. And we've also seen in um, different groups probably having the inequalities they're experiencing being enhanced as well. So it's something that we've got to, to work together on. Um, and it covers some of the aspects that, that uh, around tackling poverty, child poverty in general, but, but wider poverty as well. And, and it, it's not just about dealing now and supporting people now, which is a huge pas aspect of the work, but it's also looking at the causes of that poverty. So, so we've got to bring things, as you say, about economic development. We've got to bring things like good, good fair work, good jobs into our local areas to help address some of those, those issues of, of inequalities as well. So, yes, um, I think we've had it enhanced recently, and we need to, to work together as a priority to address inequalities. But in, order, in doing that, I think it's really important that we work with our communities and each area we have across Scotland, because those inequalities experienced in, in an urban area will be different from a rural area, will be different from an, uh, an island area. And we've got to make sure we work closely with the local communities, just like has been happening during COVID months, to work locally with people to try and address the, the, the situations that people are noticing where they live and respond to local needs in partnership. Now, now, that's moving on, obviously, to something that's happened very strongly over the recent months, that local partnership working. And one reason this has been able to happen is, is the barriers have been, been, been taken down. Um, there has been money put into the system to allow things to happen. Now, now money into the system is, is a key, key aspect. During COVID, for various reasons, money was put in to deal with immediate needs. Um, long term, we've got to look at the funding of local government. We've got to look at how we can continue that, that local funding to make sure that supports put in at the time during COVID can continue. We've developed good working relationships with, with um, the third sector in our local communities. And I, I think people... Um, and are open to continue that. I mean, it, it's been what so many benefits where I'm a councillor in particular. We, we've seen that with, with third sector community groups working with council officers and council officers taking the lead to, to, to help make sure that inequalities are addressed, that there's not people missed out. You know, we, we have the overview of what's needed in an area as the councillor, and that's been able to help support the local groups. And also at a, a national level um, in, the, in the last parliament, uh, 
um, SVCBO and Cosla and the and Aileen Campbell, the, the then minister, signed signed an agreement to, uh, to work together a protocol for working together at the national level, third sector, Scottish government, and local government as well. You mentioned economic development as being a key aspect of the work, and yes, this this is an absolute key to what we're doing. Um, and local government has to be at the centre of this. You know, local government employs 250,000 people across Scotland. You know, in many areas, we are the biggest employer uh, and have a huge influence we can make locally in terms of that economic development, in terms of the jobs we provide to, to people living and working in the area, and obviously jobs locally provided in an area. The spend is also in the area as well in many cases, so that, that is an important aspect of economic development. Councils as well, you know, that, that their power over procurement, their involvement in, in the procurement and the money they spend on local services can also be an important aspect of economic development locally and how and working together to, to improve that, uh, that procurement. We mentioned earlier together, as it was mentioned earlier today, also community wealth building and, and the work that can be done as part of the economic development to, to local government as an anchor in a community, helping make the best use of local resources that are there to help drive that, that economic development. All these are absolutely essential. And what I'm saying as well, I hope, is leading to, to um, the sense of joined up nature of local government's work. The procurement, the employment, the development in education skills and training, the apprenticeships local government can offer, where I am as a councillor myself, the foundation apprenticeships are a really key aspect of what we're doing uh, through our local schools and, and encouraging people to have the skills to move forward. All this work, um, the housing that you know helps people in their communities as well, it's all linked through local government as helping that, that economic work. Ourselves as well, um, Business Gateway is, is, one, is, is an aspect of of um, COSLA is, is one of our organizations and the work they're doing across our communities as well is, is, is huge to, to, to help businesses develop, to be able to provide those jobs, to be able to be that function in the community. So um, I agree that local government has a key role in economic development. I agree that economic development is a key aspect in the recovery moving forward and that we must be able to be empowered to play our part in developing that, building on the partnerships that have developed during COVID and moving forward and hopefully, from what I'm saying here, that recognition that all these things are joined up and they need to carry on being joined up and locally empowered and locally delivered to make the best use for our local areas. Chair, can I just ask a, a quick supplementary, if it's okay? And I, I'll, I'll be brief. It's obviously one that you mentioned about the third sector, and it's a role of the TSIs. Obviously, you mentioned about collaboration, obviously working with, with the Scottish Government, with yourself. And the role of TSIs, and where do you kind of see the relationship with TSIs? Now, I know that will probably vary throughout the country, but generally the, the role of TSIs, could there be closer working, or, or what's, what's your view at the moment with the, the relationship with TSIs, with, with COSLA? We're always after even closer working, um, because that is the answer to work in our communities. That, that, is, that is the answer, looking at recovery. We can't do that when everyone's working in, in, a, in a different different sense. We do need to come together. We need to develop our work in partnership. And um, that is something that we've seen recently. Um, local government needs to be empowered to do so. I think if you look at... at um, where power has lied in the past. You know, sometimes local government has been very constrained in what it can actually do because our funding itself is, is very much centered on, on priorities from somewhere else. So much of our money is ring fenced. We don't have the flexibility to develop the local partnerships, the local links that our communities want. We need to be able to listen locally to what's needing to be delivered. We need to be able to listen and we need to be able to respond. And that, that requires us to have that empowerment that, and that democratic accountability locally to do that. But I'll just bring in Sarah if she wants to add anything to answer. Sarah, what is, please? Thanks, Councillor Everson. Yes, I think just in, in response to the, the question about the, the third sector and relationships, I think obviously the Having funding on a on a single year basis is is very frustrating from a local government perspective, especially when we're trying to work with partners. Um, and you can you're only able to um, to give them funding on a, on a single year basis. It I think if the committee was was able to focus on I think the impact of that on the wider community that would be something we'd because would value because actually we want to to not just um, support communities but we want to be able to plan for the medium to long term I mean people like the accounts commission have said that there is an absolute necessity for more focus on medium to long term planning and I think that's something that that local government really wants to do it wants to give that certainty and stability 
to its community partners as well, but actually that's extremely difficult on a on a single year basis. I think we absolutely appreciate that obviously Scottish Government has constraints that come from um, the UK Government's budget decisions and, and the, whether or not they do a, a multi-year spending review. But I think just getting that stability, especially after um, COVID and the impact that that's had, I think it, it, you could see that perhaps there is, for this current financial year and last, there, there, there was a lot of resource put into um, the system, but actually it's about taking that three, four, five year view so that we can all you know, work for the best of our communities and, and not be kind of limping from year to year um, and with, with, with less certainty about whether you can renew contracts, whether you can employ staff, etc. because that all impacts ultimately on communities. Thank you. Thank you for that, Sarah. And I'm gonna, we're going to move, change of subject a little bit, and I'm going to invite Willie Coffey with a question. Thanks very much, convener, and good morning to you, Councillor Everson. Uh, I think it's important to hear your views on the National Care Service. We spoke to the Cabinet Secretary earlier, and while it's not her direct remit, she does have a responsibility to local government. So it's just to ask you, firstly, in, in principle, does COSLA support the principle of a National Care Service? Obviously, the National Care Service has been talked to. Sorry, I was getting an echo then. Okay. The National Care Service is something that's been looked at and considered for, for many years. And I think what's important within that, and the COSLA's view on it, is that any National Care Service must be locally empowered. There are, are key, um, that there's, there's good reasons maybe to look at things like having um, a monitoring system. There's a, system, a, a good reason to look at workforce planning is a key aspect of what we need to do to, to improve our, our, our care service. And, and workforce planning is obviously something that can be done at a national level. And working as well um, on improvement at a national level. They are things that can be be looked at from a centralised point of view that will have benefits for for the whole running of, of care. So, so when we look at national care, I think the important thing is to think, what are we actually talking about? If there are things like that we're talking about, but with the services to local people, local communities, locally delivered, then, then there are huge advantages within that. Now, I, I think it's really important that when we're looking at national care, um, we realise that what we're doing, it, it seems in many ways like a distraction from what we need to do for recovery. And what we actually need to do is get things better. We need to look at those outcomes and we need to deliver things um, that improve outcomes and help that recovery that we are part of at the moment. I think it's important that there is no evidence at the moment that centralisation will deliver better outcomes. That, that's not something that, that's ever been made clear. And I, we need to make sure that what we are doing is outcome focused and, and not a distraction from recovery. In many ways, national care, as it's proposed, is an attack on localism, is an attack on the local communities. It's been an attack on, on the place-based work that, that has been talked about in the committee as well, because if you're looking at place-based, you need to look at absolutely everything that's delivered within that local area. In the Feely report, when that was um, issued last year on national care, there was on adult social care, there was a lot in the Feely report that we also agreed with, that we thought was really important. A lot of it that was person-centred, listening to our local communities and involving fair work. They are all things that we have wanted to do as, as COSDA. If you look at our own blueprint, these, these are features of our blueprint. They're what we want to deliver as well. But structural change, structural reorganisation, we don't believe is the way to do that. We think that takes away that localism, that local choice, that local involvement, that place-based work, which is so essential. It also divides things up in a way that when we're looking at care, can't actually really be divided up. In the previous answer, I mentioned how everything is intertwined at a local level. You know, part of care is, is the community in which people can, can access uh, leisure services that are appropriate, appropriate to their needs. It's the environment that is, is possible for them to go out and enjoy. It's to do with, with, with the local libraries. It's to do with the local um, leisure activities. It's to do with that, how the streets are accessible. All that must come into when we're looking at care. It's about the houses people live in. We've, we've talked about housing this morning as well and all this can, cannot really be divided up if we're actually looking look at packages that support people and are, are locally based. I think 
what was particularly concerning at the moment is how there was no prior engagement with COSRA at all about the expanded nature of what is now being put into national care. It now includes children's services, community justice services, alcohol and drug service, social work, many things that are done across our councils. And it totally represents a departure from what was in the, the Feely report as I said, many of which we actually agreed with. And there's been no evidence, there's been no reason given to us for this expansion of, in, of, of control to, to all these other areas. No reason why it's important to include these in part of the, the centralization and take away the local choice from our communities. We do need to listen to local voices. Um, as I've already said in an answer, our councillors are representing our local communities. We step up from our local councillors. Um, uh, there'll be many councillors like me who, who served in uh, on, on parent councils, community councils. You know, that, that's the kind of people that become councillors. And we've stepped up from those communities to represent them. So we, we know how important it is to have that community empowerment and to listen to those local voices. But I also think it's important to drill down to what people are actually saying. And I'm not sure people are actually saying centralization. People are talking about um, being able to, to have services delivered in one part of Scotland and have the certainty that that's person-centered approach. They can, they can access those services somewhere else if they, if they move. They're talking about issues like that. They're talking about having a basic, basic criteria, a basic standard. Well, that's something that we've seen in other areas as well. We've, <clears throat> we've had discussions around education, how education is delivered in Scotland, and you know that's the way we work in that kind of sphere. <clears throat> we've had a really good example of partnership working in the delivery of early learning and childcare, and that's done with, with central discussions about local delivery, so it's impossible to do all that. I think it's important to drill down to what people are actually wanting and see structural change is not the answer to that. Structural change will take years to put in place. It will take at least the length of this parliament. We want recovery now, we want recovery, we want funding in place, because all the things suggested will take that funding. We want funding in place to be able to deliver that recovery now, not structural change, which may or may not have an impact, but certainly in a long time ahead. Well, thank, thank you, Councillor Everson, for that. You probably answered another 10 questions in there, but it's really important to hear what you have to say there. Um, did you also hear the Cabinet Secretary saying things like, we really need to improve care, of care services across the board in Scotland, and we want to establish consistency so that the public can expect the same level and quality that they receive. How do you feel that that impacts on the local autonomy, the, the decision making that the council may choose to deploy to deliver that? I mean, is it about squaring that particular circle in a sense to achieve that outcome, but to still retain? local democratic control of it? Local councils want to improve care as well. <laughs> it's, it's obvious, and um, we've seen it highlighted in the last few months as well, that care needs to improve. And that, that, that is not, not in dispute. And working together to improve, to share that improvement, is something we are very up for. And that working in partnership, Scottish Government, local government, to, to develop that improvement is, is, is not something we're against at all. Um, local government itself, has had aspirations to improve care. We come back again to that, that funding model. You know, we haven't been able to do that prevention. I think the, the Cabinet Secretary um, hinted at issues of, of, of trying to deliver something now while also trying to do prevention. And that's certainly an issue that we recognize in local government as well. We haven't had the ability to do that prevention work. We haven't had the funding to do that. We haven't had um, the funding to be able to reward our workforce in the way that they deserve to be rewarded. We value them. We, we want to help them in their own skills and development. You know, the, the resources haven't been to do that. So, but now we have talking about fair work being important. Yes, it is important, but we can deliver it another way. So not against improvement, want to work together on improvement, but having the funding close to where the services are delivered I think is absolutely crucial. Allowing local people to have a voice in how those services are delivered in their area is important. Yes, national criteria, so there's a there's a basic a basic level that people can get wherever they want. But you know, in, in a local area, if people have a particular desire to, to, to develop care in a, in a in a particular way to spend, um, then they should be able to deliver that as well. And and that wider understanding of the leisure services, the local environment, the housing. All this that must be part of care if it's to be effective, I think that is best at a local level. So um, improvement, yes, work together on that. Very happy to do that. Funding essential. 
we can do um, we can do a lot of the improvement work if we're giving the funding to do so and um, uh, workforce planning centrally and um, agreed criteria which is a, a basic field from which all we can work happy to work on those levels as well um, so there's a lot there we do agree on taking it all centrally is not the answer Thank you for that. Thank, thank, thank you. you for that. And I'm going to bring in Miles Briggs with a supplementary question. Uh, thank, thank you, convener. Um, I think we were all taken by your strongly worded statement around this, uh, which uh, caused their issued. Um, so I had a couple of points I wanted to ask you, um, specifically around um, your views on whether or not integration of health and social care you feel worked and whether or not that's really um, what's driving this centralisation approach which we could potentially see and put the question to you which I put to the cabinet secretary do you actually think that local government will have more fewer powers um, and control over budgets by the end of this parliament as integration works I think um, in different parts of the country it, it's maybe different and that's maybe something we, we can look at as well and, and work on that one um, I think if you come back to what we were doing in our local governance review and one of our key aspects of that was functional empowerment and by that we meant allowing different bodies to work together effectively to deliver to their local area and um, in this case we're talking about the NHS and local councils working together you know for as long as that functional power empowerment isn't there hasn't been there people haven't been able to get down and work together just looking at what's important in their local area to address that and where the um, integrated boards haven't worked is where that functional empowerment hasn't been possible to be able to put into place and work effectively in that local area because the boards are organized differently we've we've had um, that silo approach maybe in, in the way government ministers are looking for, for aims and, and uh, outcomes in their own areas rather than looking across the piece and, and maybe with recovery agenda we're, we're getting more to looking across the piece rather than in silos and maybe that's that's a benefit from what we're doing but when different parts of the public sector have been working with different budget setups different priorities to spend um, different ways individual people are empowered or not to work in their local areas it hasn't always been effective and we we've had a very in a great innovative innovative ideas like like in Orkney you know wanting to develop develop the, um, the single public service model in which they have one public service in Orkney um, I think it's 22,000 people there you know but you've got the NHS you've got the council let's bring it all together so people can they can work together more effectively and deliver services so we're up for that innovation we've had ideas for innovation and improvement we've found barriers preventing us to deliver that innovation and I think in many cases the integrated joint boards given that a power to innovate take on the improvements could actually be delivering what people are, are looking for and what asking for across their local areas what do I think about the end of this Parliament and whether local government will have more or less powers at the end of it you know I think Scotland will be the loser if local government has fewer powers we are a key sphere of government in Scotland we are the voice of our local communities we come out of our communities we represent those communities we work with our communities at that local level and we recognize that the 32 council areas and areas within those 32 council areas are very different across Scotland as well and so we work in that responsive way and if we're talking about doing things like delivering community wealth building if we're developing of talking about those 20 minute neighborhoods if we're talking about a place-based approach to planning or whatever else it is we need that local voice that local representation so um, I think it's something it would be good if we could work with the committee on to encourage that voice of local democracy to continue that voice of local government to continue that funding for local government which has been on a on a steep decline over recent years we can have the money available to, to be able to respond to local choices I actually think Scotland will be a bit better for it and we will have locally um, local services delivered as people want them locally Alison and um, I, I've been uh, in this role I've been learning a lot very quickly about local government and uh, and fiscal framework has been something that's kind of piqued my interest and it's given that the Scottish government's uh, invitation to lo to local government to bring forward a con for consideration your own proposals for such a framework could you tell the committee how a fiscal framework between the government and local government could work and following on what needs to be done to ensure that this rules-based system could work and what are the barriers to progress 
given most of these issues, for example, ring fencing, single year budgets, and unsatisfactory changes to settlements have been discussed for decades. Yes, we've actually had an, um, an agreement from, from the Scottish Government in, in the last Parliament to develop a fiscal framework. And um, looking at their proposals now for, for council tax and how that's going to be discussed, it kind of raises issues about what happens to the agreement we had already about the fiscal framework. The issues you raised there are absolutely crucial. Um, the ring fencing money, the, the money coming in small pots throughout a year rather than decided at the beginning. As, um, Sarah, what has already described, that totally prevents long-term planning, whether it's working with third sector partners or whether it's working with ourselves and, and um, giving security of employment to, to local officers to develop that economic development. We've also talked about here, you know, you need to have people in, in place who know they're going to be there for more than one year um, to be able to do that kind of work. So there's huge questions here, but I'm going to pass on to Sarah to, to answer this in detail because that's her, her particular area to, to review. So Sarah, please. Thanks, Councillor Everson. Yes, absolutely. As, and obviously, as part of the local governance review, we're extremely keen to, to develop proposals around fiscal framework. Um, in relation to the, the review, there's a review currently going on about the UK Scottish Government fiscal framework, and actually Councillor McGregor has a, a call with Ms Forbes on Wednesday to, to talk about that. I think what, um, if, if you read the manifesto commitments um, that the Scottish Government has around the, the UK local government, uh, UK Scottish Government framework, sorry, I think a lot of the aspirations that they have in, in that document are actually what we would like to see translated into a fiscal framework uh, between Scottish and local government. So things like more stability and certainty, uh, borrowing powers, um, other, other areas of local taxation, for example, that we would like to see brought into that. But I think when you when you speak certainly to the professional associations such as Solis, directors of finance at the moment, the thing they are absolutely craving is stability and certainty, and that is really I think what would would get everybody off to a much better on a bit much better footing for um, recovery. I think that is absolutely key. I think the other thing is around transparency within the local government settlement. Uh, members will be aware of a briefing, hopefully, that SPICE have produced at Local Government Finance Concepts, Trends and Debates. I think it's a really, really useful document. I think it, it presents the complexity of the local government's funding um, sort of landscape as it, as it sits at the moment. I think you mentioned things like IGBs um, and, and what's working, what's not working. I think when they were introduced, they were meant, meant to introduce seamless budgets. But actually, that has, has been very, very difficult, um, as there's been a focus on, on health budgets, on, on acute services. And I think local government would say, at the expense of local government, if you look at the, the share that the that local government gets of the, the Scottish government's overall budget, that has declined over recent years. I think in the past, COSLA has tended to look at cash terms funding um, because it's very you know it's, it's very clear you know how much cash you've got this year compared to last year but actually when you look at the real terms reduction in funding I think that's very telling within the, the spice report because that actually tells you what's happened in terms of, of, of meeting things like pay pressures demand pressures inflation those are the things that local government has to cope with on the ground every year um, and that is I think that cut, that sort of real terms cut, is I think what's inhibiting that that kind of longer term view. So I think what our aspirations for a fiscal framework are stability and certainty, certainly um, transparency. But I think that I think there's a, another aspiration is about growing the size of of the, the 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 funding pie, if you like, so that we do have the opportunity of locally appropriate tax raising powers. Um, but I think that, that would be absolutely important to stress. It must be locally appropriate. It has to work um, for for a local area. So, for example, if a, if we are considering things like um, tourist tax or workplace parking, or indeed any other ideas that we would like to explore in partnership with Scottish government, it absolutely has to be taken um, as is locally appropriate. So we will be we've, we have a working group within COSLA. Um, Councillor McGregor will be discussing the, the work of the working group with, with Ms Forbes on, on Wednesday, and we'd like to think by the end of September we'll have some, some good firm proposals to bring the, the Cabinet Secretary for discussion. Thank you very much for that, Sarah. I'm just going to move on to another topic, um, and I'm going to invite Megan Gallagher to ask the question. 
Thank you, convener, and good morning, President and Sarah. Um, the question I have um, for you both is in relation to participatory budgeting and also community empowerment. Um, and the question relates to whether progress is being made to ensure that all communities, and not just those with the confidence and expertise, um, are being heard um, and are, part are participating in budget decisions in local authorities. And perhaps quickly, just as a follow-on, um, do you think that as we emerge from the pandemic, um, communities will be more engaged with budget setting processes of the Council and do you think there will be a, a change in attitude in terms of a willingness um, for communities to be more engaged? Thank you very much for that question, Megan. And yes, uh, participatory budgeting is something, something that, that COS has been signed up for and has been uh, supporting very much. We've got officers who are based at COSLA who are working on participatory budgeting and supporting our communities. A point I would make about it, however, that's often raised, is it's really important for communities to be able to have participatory budgeting with their local councils, but also with the wider public sector as well. It should go beyond council budgets. It should go to, to other aspects of the public sector as well. And it's something we've been pushing for uh, as, as a really important development because we shouldn't presuppose what communities are wanting to, to get involved in. It should be up to communities to decide what they want to be involved in participating on. Um, it, it is something that's, that's extending across the country. There, there's obviously many some areas like Fife have been doing participatory budgeting for years and are, and are way, way ahead of this. And other areas, it's just developing through, through grant schemes to, to practice what they're doing and, and to start on a smaller way. But the commitment across Scotland is there, even if, if the pandemics may be held up progress in some particular areas. Are all communities being heard? I mean, um, I listened with interest when the Cabinet Secretary made comments about this earlier because um, a big concern that we have had is that some communities are able to, to get up and run and, and do things and, and, and organise themselves and do participatory budgeting. Other communities um, aren't. Uh, maybe they're newer communities. Maybe they don't have that le local leadership developed to, to be able to take things on. Um, maybe it's a it's maybe a more of a commuter area and they don't have that, that sense of working in their local area. And I think, um, or maybe they're more disparate, you know, maybe they're more spread up and don't have the same heart that other communities have just because of their geographical location. Um, there's lots of reasons why, why uh, places are maybe not as ready or able to do it. But that is, comes back to the role of local councils again. Now, as we're moving forward with community empowerment, as we're moving forward with, with maybe it's community wealth building that's being looked at, maybe it's participatory budgeting, the local council is, is the body locally that can give that support to iron out those inequalities, to, to, to empower communities, to support them, to develop them, so that they are able to come forward with their ideas. And it is only through local government you will have those inequalities um, um, ironed out. I don't think it's enough to say they exist and some communities are further ahead than others. I think it's our job in local government and the job we're totally up for to, to, um, to make sure that everybody has a voice, everybody can take part, and everyone can take advantage of that empowerment because um, what we're after, after all, is that local voice coming forward. We, we, we are part of those communities. We, are, we, we come from our communities. We represent those communities. So it's really important that local voice is here, and that is our function in our councils. Thank, Thank you. you. I'd like to um, bring in Ella, Eleanor Whitten, uh, continuing the theme of community wealth building. Thanks for that, convener. And um, President, you've mentioned community wealth building quite a few times throughout your evidence with us today. Um, in a recent letter to the committee, um, the Scottish Government um, said, we intend to introduce community wealth building legislation during the current session to encourage the model's wider adopt adoption across Scotland. Part of this will be the removal of any impediments experienced by local authorities and other anchor organisations seeking to advance the wellbeing economy. Can I ask what caused this understanding of what these impediments are? Um, and what more the Scottish Government can do to re help remove these barriers? Obviously, I mean, I, I would argue strongly that our councils are the anchor in our communities. They're one of the ones of the overview. So they need to be able to, to develop that place-based approach 
reach um, make sure they can use all local resources to, to harness existing resources to support the local economy, to, to look at procurement, how procurement is organised, what they can use their the system of procurement for, how that can be developed um, to, to, to support community wealth building as well. And obviously um, through employment and their use of land and assets locally, it's all part of the community wealth building and having the power for, for communities to be, as, as council, to be able to support that work to bring about place-based inclusive growth. It's important that we do this to create resilient economies so as we, we can help prepare and um, prevent further problems for our communities and further economic problems going forward. I think it's important that we have um, we are encouraged to um, have collaborative working across the piece that um, issues around procurement in particular are removed so that we can, we, can, we can look locally at what's best to spend that money. Issues about um, how we can work across across the public sector in a local area, that there's not always easy to do that either. And we need to get rid of all the uh, impediments like that as we are moving forward. And have that joint interest that community wealth building is not just about your local council. <laughs> it's about everyone in a local area working together. And we've got to make sure that all functions of the public sector are able to take that on board as well. Um, we've got some great examples of how uh, how things are developing community wealth building, the Ayrshire is in general, but uh, as you know, uh, our heads of this and North Ayrshire in particular has done a lot of work as well, but, but Ayrshire is in general uh, have done a lot of work along this and we need to learn from them where the impediments were. We need to listen and learn to what they found works, what they found hasn't worked and need to respond together to address those. But again, I'll pass on to Sarah for any specific answers, Sarah. Thanks, Councillor Everson. Yeah, I, th I think I would go back again to w one of the issues about, certainly on the revenue side, about one-year funding. I think that if we're really to, to spread the benefits within supply chains and encourage innovation, especially in terms of things like um, net zero, I think that going from year to year makes it very difficult to drive that innovation and, and give that certainty within local supply chains. And certainly, I, I think there's no business locally wouldn't welcome um, a degree of certainty that the public sector, because of its scale, could actually bring. Um, I think on the capital side, I think local government has a huge part to play in terms of stimulating local economies through capital projects. I think it was disappointing last year to see the, the five-year capital spending review come forward with, with plans. Uh, well, it was welcome to have five-year plans, but actually the level of capital funding um, was significantly reduced. I think there is concern that that will really inhibit the role that local government can play locally. Um, our projects, be it flood, flood risk management projects or um, other school building projects, housing projects, they can really create a lot of, of training, apprenticeships, job opportunities, and then leave a, a kind of legacy within that community. But I think if, if we're to really get to the heart of community wealth building, then, then we do need that, um, that, that longer term, that, but even that medium term view, not even, even longer term. And I think just a, a kind of honesty about what local government actually has um, discretion over, sp over spending locally. A lot of local government's uh, spend is directed, uh, and we would like to see more of, of that being able to, uh, decisions being able to take, being taken locally. And as Councillor Everson said, quite rightly, across partnerships as well. I think if, if things like IGBs were truly empowered to make those local decisions about care, about support, and do it together and not be inhibited by their accounting structures, um, and reporting, then I think we could probably make real strides in community wealth building. Thank you for that, Sarah. It's great points on, on how we can go forward to build community wealth. I'd like to, um, we're going to change the uh, subject a little bit. We're a bit concerned about um, some things we've heard about the levelling up fund, and I'm going to invite Willie Coffey to ask some questions about that. Thanks very much again, convener. Um, on the question, uh, Councillor Everson, of the former European Union structural funds and so on, levelling up funds, shared prosperity funds. Has COSLA had any direct um, engagement with the UK government on any of this? Um, you might have heard our Cabinet Secretary last week saying there had been none between the Scottish government and the UK government on this entire process. So has COSLA had that direct engagement with the UK government, and do you share the Cabinet Secretary's concerns about the potential impact of that on the Scottish Bloc grant? Thank you. We've had opportunities to 
talk about the leveling up fund but not in a way that would influence the leveling up fund i think is the way um i would would word an answer to that one um we haven't had any involvement in in the design of it or or the implementation of it so i think that's that's the major point of your question though we have through our um through, through um the Scotland office through um, our environment and economy spokesperson Steve had we've had individual conversations but not in a way that could influence how things are done and um, I, I, I think um, when we're talking about localism when we're talking about things in a local area really understanding what's needed I think you know that that's probably a missed opportunity to actually look through our councils at what's needed in a local area but again this is a specific question that I will pass directly to Sarah to, to give a fuller answer on as well thank you Sarah Thanks, Councillor Everson. Yeah, that, absolutely. We, we would obviously share Scottish Government's concerns at anything that would have a, an impact on the block grant adjustment. That will obviously form part of the, the discussions that, that Ms Forbes is having at a, a UK level on the, the review of the framework. I know that within their manifesto, Scottish Government are very keen to, to expand the scope of that, that review of the, the UK Scottish Government fiscal framework. And I think we would absolutely want as much transparency as possible about the impact of levelling up because you know we can't just see you know things being given with one hand and taken away with another especially as Councillor Everson says we haven't really had an opportunity to shape these funds um, we've recently uh, done a piece of work with with all directors of finance just to to kind of find out how, how engaged they are with these funds and I think that what we're hearing is that the timescales were just very 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 challenging for councils a lot of them want to engage with maybe levelling to round two, um, levelling up round two, for example, but it, the, the timescales were extremely challenging. Um, but I think there's a reality from a council perspective that, that they will have to engage with it. it it's, it's another source of, of funding and absolutely want to engage. Um, but I think it's through the, the, the fiscal framework work at all levels, I think we need to make sure there's absolute transparency so we know the impact of, of this funding um, and that, it's, that it is, that, that it is additional um, to, to what's actually all already in the system. Thanks for that. So, yeah, do, you, do you see a potential issue for local autonomy uh, in there too, in much the same the way that we discussed earlier with the National Care Service? Do you see any risk or threat to local decision making and accountability through this process? I think one of the, I suppose one of the key concerns about the whole levelling up is is the bid approach to, to funding because you know the, the bid approach is is not necessarily getting to places of greatest need. It's getting to places that can, to put it bluntly, write good bids and and submit them. So it, you know that it may be it may come down to capacity locally, and I think that would be really disappointing if the, if there are areas of, of real need, but actually for for a variety of reasons they don't have the capacity. So I think that's that's a major uh, concern from from local government. I think as you as you probably well know, COSLA prefers a, a distribution of funding and um, that's need based, that's client based. So so having to constantly work in a bid environment. I think is is not necessarily what COSLA would would want to see for this type of funding. Thank you very much for that to both of you. Thank you very much for that. That actually concludes our questions for the morning, and it's been a very rich and thought provoking session. I think I think it's been uh, formed a really good basis for our work going forward. So thank you for spending the time with us and and sharing your views. It's been a pleasure to be here talking to you this morning. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm now going to close the public part of this meeting and move the meeting into private session as previously agreed for item three.